Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the University of Milton. On behalf of the university, on behalf of President Hurley, who is busy this evening with the Board of Visitors, uh, who he has at his house and having a meeting. <clears throat> so I'm very, very pleased to bring greetings on behalf of the university. It's also my pleasure to introduce the first person who's going to speak to you, Speaker Bill Howell, who probably needs no introduction whatsoever, <clears throat> who has been Speaker of the House of Delegates for almost 10 years. <clears throat> this old institution has been in existence longer than any other uh, elected uh, lawmaking body in the New World. He was first elected in 1987 and represents the 28th House District, which includes parts of Stafford County and the city of Fred Fredericksburg. I asked him what I should say in introducing him, and his wife quickly pulled me aside and gave me a few stories she thought perhaps I should tell, uh, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I will say only that uh, Speaker Howell has been a student of history himself for quite some time, and he patroned legislation for and serves on, uh, serves as chairman of the Virginia Sesquicentennial of the American Civil War Commission. So this is, this is something close to his heart, which is preparing to mark the, the anniversaries this year uh, in that uh, chapter of America's past. So without any further ado, I would ask Speaker Bill Howell to come forward. Thank you very much. Good evening. And thank you, Dr. Newbold, for that kind introduction. On behalf of the Virginia Sesquicentennial of the American Civil War Commission, I'd like to welcome each of you tonight to this fireside chat. It's a pleasure to be here with you on this beautiful campus of the University of Mary Washington, and I can't imagine a better location than Fredericksburg to frame tonight's conversation. As many of you know, tomorrow marks the 150th anniversary of the issuance of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and it's important that we pause to reflect on this significant milestone on the pathway to freedom. Fireside chats became popular during the Great Depression. They were informal talks that explained serious ideas, and tonight's program was envisioned in that same tradition. Three of the premier Lincoln scholars have gathered together, as they have many times in the past, for a conversation about one of America's enduring documents of freedom. Each brings a unique background and perspective. One is a former state Supreme Court Chief Justice. One is a noted professor of African American history at Howard University. And one is a scholar from the Metropolitan Museum of Art who specializes in the imagery of the time. We're indeed delighted to have them here tonight and look forward to listening in on their discussions. But to begin the program, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce one of the most highly regarded Civil War historians in the country. Many of you know that Dr. James I. Robertson, Jr. retired last year from Virginia Tech, where he served as the Alumni Distinguished Professor of History for more than 40 years. And many of you know that Dr. Robertson is the author or editor of dozens of books, including the definitive biography on Stonewall Jackson, his most recent effort is available in the lobby. I'll give him a little plug. It's a, a fantastic book called Untold Civil War. It's just a wonderful brief series of vignettes on the war published by National Geographic. But what probably some of you don't know is that Bud is a charter member of the Virginia sesquicentennial of the American Civil War Commission, and that it's because of his guidance and tireless dedication that Virginia leads the nation in the sesquicentennial commemoration. His contributions are almost too numerous to mention, but I believe that his lasting legacy may well be the production of an Emmy-nominated DVD on the Civil War that the commission has placed in every single high school, uh, every single public school in Virginia, which will serve as a resource to students and teachers for many, many years to come. Bud 
is truly a treasure to the Commonwealth and someone that I'm very proud to call a good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James I. Robertson, Jr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those very exaggerated but deeply appreciated uh, remarks. And welcome to you all on, at this particular fireside chat tonight. It's a unique thing in the sesquicentennial, and we're quite anxious to get your reactions to it. I would like to express everyone's thanks to Dominion Trust, to the State Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission, and to the University of Murray, Washington, for their cooperation and support. Uh, for this particular program. After the uh, presentations this evening, there will be a book signing and a reception across the way in Twinkle Hall. It's the Green Dome building, and we do hope that you will stop by and say hello to the honored uh, guests that we have here comprising this panel tonight. Some commentators have called it, quote, the single most significant statement of policy issued by a governing authority in the history of the United States or, quote, the single most dramatic and far-reaching action taken by the Lincoln administration, or, quote, an act of immense historic consequence, or, quote, a gigantic stride in the paths of Christian and civilized progress. Fault finders, who are also numerous, dismissed the document as a military measure issued under the president's war powers, a document of questionable constitutionality, ambiguous in content, and transparently hypocritical in that Abraham Lincoln gave freedom only to the slaves his government could not free, namely those locked in the Southern Confederacy. Perhaps all of the above is true. Perhaps none of the above has validity. In any case, Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation go far beyond the apotheosis in which artists have often painted them to be. By the summer of 1862, Lincoln was at cross purposes. He was trying to win what many thought was a limited war by employing limited means. That Lincoln began discussing openly the idea of emancipation in July of 1862 gave credence to the belief that General George McClellan's folly on the Virginia Peninsula was a major impetus in his decision. So was the proclamation a military measure? Lincoln was aware that the war was then at a stalemate. Army against army was not the solution to victory. The war had to become a struggle of society against society. And if the North could shatter the underpinning of Southern society, slavery, the Confederacy would cease to be. Yet Lincoln had to wait for a major Union success in the field. Otherwise, any proclamation on slavery would be viewed as desperation rather than liberation. Was the document a social measure? Abolitionists were demanding that Lincoln incorporate free blacks into the army. Runaway male blacks, they insisted, could have a home waiting for them in the Union Army. In spite of all the angelic pictures painted by brush and pen relative to the Emancipation Proclamation, how much did morality really play in Lincoln's action? Did the document have any relationship to the great industrial revolution that would soon turn the fledgling nation into a world power? And of course, one always has to ask, especially in an age of shaky government, to what extent did politics guide Lincoln to his monumental decision? Nevertheless, spawned by the Civil War, nurtured by Union victory, and ultimately the bloom that became the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the Emancipation Proclamation remains a decree that cannot be ignored. So it is a personal honor for me this evening to introduce three Lincoln scholars, all close friends, so well known and so highly esteemed, I will not waste time enumerating their virtues. I do enough of that behind their backs. So I'd like to introduce you now, your panelists in your panel for the evening, starting with first the Honorable Frank Williams, 
Dr. Edward Edna Green Medford. <laughs> Dr. Harold Holzer. <laughs> and the moderator for this evening's program, Linwood Evans. And this panel will dissect and diagnose the action that opened the door for black freedom in the United States. Mr. Evans, I yield the floor to you. I'm Woody Evans, your host. This fireside chat was inspired by a wonderful book, The Emancipation Proclamation, Three Views, written by our distinguished authors and historians, Frank Williams, Edna Green Medford, and Harold Holzer. I believe that just like me, after I've had an opportunity to read this book, study other documents, and talk with these distinguished authors, you will, come away, you will come away with a sense of a different perspective about the Emancipation Proclamation. I came away knowing that there were things I didn't know about this document that I now know. I came away knowing that there were totally different perspectives about this document, and I came away knowing that I was truly educated about this era. Carol Holzer is now going to walk us through some pictures and images around the Emancipation Proclamation. But I wanna, I wanna mention one thing. Harold hails from New York. And New York State now is preserving the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. As a matter of fact, it just went on tour yesterday. Harold, the floor is yours. Thank you, Woody. And thank you for the New York plug. We do own the preliminary proclamation which Abraham Lincoln donated to a charity fair in New York State in 1864, and uh, the New York State Legislature, in one of its rare acts of unanimity at that time or since, purchased it for $1,000 in 1865, and we've preserved it ever since. So I, I seldom get the chance to lead the group. I usually bring up the rear with the illustrations, but it's fun to to get the chance to show the pictures first. And why they're important is not, they're not just pictures. They are expressions of the meaning of and impact of the Emancipation Proclamation in its own time. They reflect um, passionate points of view about it, pro and con, uh, north and south. And I think, um, in a way, we've, many of us have sort of lost our appreciation for the revolutionary aspect of the proclamation in its day. I think these pictures will give you an idea. And if the first one is up, um, you will see a, uh, a rather cluttered uh, but affectionate portrayal uh, in 1863 by a German artist named David Blythe showing Lincoln writing the Emancipation Proclamation. Of course, I doubt whether his housekeepers would have let him operate in a room like this, but, um, and, but the idea is to show that he's using all of these symbols, the Bible, the, uh, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the American flag as his curtain, um, dressed in the unaffected garb of a rail splitter um, as he ponders the great challenge ahead of him. By the way, that's a bust of James Buchanan that you see strung by the neck from the bookcase in the center of the picture. Now in this next image, here is a totally different view of writing the Emancipation Proclamation. Now this is by a Baltimore artist, a pro-Confederate Baltimore artist named Adelbert Volk. And here is Lincoln writing the proclamation again, but this time he has his foot on the Bible. This time he's drawing ink from an inkwell that's proffered by the devil himself. Um, John Brown is a saint in the background, and just uh, the, the curtains are now tied back with a vulture's head, not an American flag. And just for good measure, if you think Lincoln could have been 
sober when he did it, when he wrote the proclamation, there is a whiskey glass, uh, a whiskey decanter and glasses on the table in the, in the background. None of them show the wonderful fireplace at the White House, which we've replicated here, by the way. Now, here's a Richmond newspaper's idea of what Lincoln revealed of himself uh, after writing the proclamation. He's not inspired by the devil. He is, in fact, a masked devil himself, and he's unmasked himself as of January 1st, and awaiting him on the unfinished stump of the Washington Monument is a gallows, his just rewards for doing what he did. And if you notice the little joke within the joke, the gallows is made of wooden rails, like the kind that he was renowned for splitting. So here's another indication. By 64, northern printmakers are in fact putting out editions of the proclamation, whose language is not terribly inspiring. But so to, to sort of create a, an atmosphere of excitement, there are patriotic pictures of great Americans past and present. And this particular print was actually presented by Abraham Lincoln, as you see in this, in this next image. This is an actual advertising sheet showing Max Rosenthal presenting this, this image to Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln called it ingenious nonsense, by the way, making a play of the words. Now here is a picture of the man, well, the man who wrote the proclamation, and also the man who did more than any other to create the image of it as a great act of history. Uh, the man who is not Lincoln, but is sitting in the same chair, by the way, Alexander Gardner's chair at his Washington studio, is a New York artist named Francis Carpenter, who came to the White House and spent six months working on a grand canvas of the first reading of the proclamation, not in September, not the one we celebrate tomorrow, but the one in July uh, that his cabinet actually advised him not to issue. It was a peculiar choice. Uh, one thing Carpenter did is take the first photograph of any American president in the White House. Uh, you can see that the lighting is not professional, but ne nevertheless, here is Abraham Lincoln in his chair at the head of the cabinet table in what is today the Lincoln bedroom and you just see the corner of the hearth there, and he's holding a paper. And out of, from that, Carpenter did a life study, and from life studies of all the other cabinet members, this grand canvas, some of you may have seen it, it's in the US Capitol. Carpenter hoped it would wind up in the rotunda, it didn't, but it is near the Senate gallery. And it actually shows the moment when William Seward, who is sitting uh, to the right of the scene, with his hand ponderously on the table and his other hand in his, in his jacket, Napoleon style, Seward said, you can't issue the proclamation. It would seem like a last shriek on the retreat. You've got to wait for a Union victory. And Lincoln agreed to do it. But by the time he did, and by the time it became official, um, this print inspired a, an array of engraved adaptations. This is the official print adaptation. It became the most popular print of the 19th century, issued in editions through the 1890s, and copied by many printmakers who sort of lost the sense of how the cabinet members were grouped, liberals on the left, conservatives on the right. Copyright laws were so loose in those days that people just copied the pictures any old way and nobody ever got into trouble. Um, here's another example. Another variation on the theme, they've moved Seward closer to Lincoln and put Secretary of War Stanton in Seward's place. Here's one of my favorites. Um, Lincoln and his cabinet all scattered about with General Grant uh, joining the scene for some inexplicable reason. Now this printmaker is a man named Thomas Kelly from New York. And um, he realized at the time he celebrated emancipation that more important because with picture makers, not necessarily painters, but people who published engravings and lithographs, popular prints for mass audiences, what was always the most important thing is the profit motive. So even as he's doing a celebration of emancipation, he's also realizing that by 1865 and 66, the Southern marketplace is opening as well. So he takes Lincoln's cabinet and does the following. He makes it Jefferson Davis and his cabinet, gathered for some reason in the White House. Um, and this was designed for the Southern marketplace. I don't know if anyone in the South who might have bought this print ever came to the 
full realization that Jefferson Davis, like Abraham Lincoln, is holding the Emancipation Proclamation in his hand. I have just a couple more to show you. There was no great emancipation moment in Lincoln's life. Lincoln did not go out and liberate slaves uh, personally in the manner of the great David Danger Bronze called La Frique of a, of a, of a white uh, liberator liberating people of color. That didn't happen. So printmakers invented the, the artistic device of the kneeling slave or rising slave. Didn't happen, but it certainly appears in much art of the period and in sculptures as well, including the famous sculpture in Washington, D.C. that Frederick Douglass himself dedicated. And then something else happens at the end of this period of celebration. By the way, celebrations of the pictorial kind were not common in 1862, 3, a little bit in 64 for the re-election campaign, mostly not until 1865, until Lincoln's death, did printmakers feel that it was sort of safe to touch this toxic, controversial subject. Another indication that it was controversial. Now here's one that is one of the first prints designed for an African-American audience. Frederick Douglass is one of those big advocates of African-Americans beginning to collect pictures for their homes. He regards it as a mark of civilization. So here is Lincoln in an African-American church, simply standing and gesturing as the hand of God reveals the Emancipation Proclamation to great jubilation. And I end with this extraordinary print by a, an Alabama printmaker, believe it or not, named A.B. Daniel, uh, which shows Abraham Lincoln receiving the Emancipation Scroll from an angel of color, unique in Lincoln iconography, and with it, specific instructions to African Americans to reverence Abraham Lincoln in your homes. So here is the beginning of the cult of the great emancipator as vivified in images. Great. Frank, I understand that your interest uh, goes back to age 11 when you were seated under a picture of Abraham Lincoln in elementary school. Or to remember, we were all seated alphabetically by author Williams, last row, last seat. And I was seated under a uh, large print engraving of Lincoln, and I loved the face. And people have called it a pine cone face, but Mrs. Taylor, my sixth grade teacher, isn't it amazing how we remember the teachers who've influenced us? She saw this and she helped direct my interest. I was already very much interested in American history, and she was very uh, supportive. And. Uh, a couple of years later, I decided to be a lawyer. I was 13 then, <laughs> because Lincoln was a lawyer. I'm not sure we, we really know very much at 13 about life's careers, but uh, that, was, uh, that led to, to my, my uh, profession. I spent my lunch money buying Lincoln books, all of 25 cents a day, and uh, that's what started the collecting part of uh, the study of Lincoln and the Civil War. And I know your, your interest relates to the military aspects, legal, and, and some of the right. moral issues that right. came out of the Emancipation Well, one, one of the reasons I, I became a lawyer, uh, because Lincoln was a lawyer, was because of the tremendous legal ramifications of this very proclamation and how Lincoln got there and how he was really the vortex of so many pressures and influences. Uh, and for him to have the focus in the midst of war, the Civil War, which is really the most terrific kind of war that any nation or country can sustain, and still find a way. It wasn't a perfect way. And as Harold indicated, this was not one moment. Uh, it was it was over. It was the, the fit and start and what Lincoln used in another context, the friction and abrasion of the issue of slavery and what to do with the African-American man and woman and children. And uh, that that has always fascinated me because how we came out or how Lincoln came out was to me a matter of great leadership. It was a, tr a transformative moment in American history. 
probably uh, as transformative as the Declaration of Independence uh, in 1776. Well, Bud, Bud, in his great introductory remarks, asked really almost rhetorically, uh, what is it? Is it a military document? Is it a political document? Is it a moral document? A social document? And, and this isn't, this isn't um, escaping the, the real issues here, but what if I were to say it's a combination of all these factors? Now, clearly, can we have the next slide, Harold? I think it's 16. It's 18. Here's 18. the proclamation. 18. Um, this is a uh, printed copy of the proclamation, if we can get it up on the screen. There it is. Uh, which was sold at sanitary fairs after its issuance. And in the end, Lincoln is basing this proclamation on what? The war powers. Clearly not defined in the Constitution, which says in Article 2 that the President shall be the Commander-in-Chief, but it doesn't say what that means. And Lincoln is basing this document and its act on the fact that as commander-in-chief he could do certain things in wartime that he could not do in peacetime. And one of them was to seize the property of the enemy. Slaves were property with the valuation of each slave placed next to that slave's name in the tax assessor's books. But something happened when, when freedom came and that slave was manumitted or freed it wasn't property anymore. We were dealing with a person. And that was quite a change in our culture, a significant change. And in the next to last paragraph, Lincoln talks about that this act is a matter of justice, requiring the use of the proclamation as a military measure. So Lincoln is basing his act as commander in chief with the war powers as a military measure. He had already received an opinion from the Solicitor General of the Army, uh, Whiting, who indicated that it was constitutional for the President to perform such an act because he was the Commander-in-Chief. But Lincoln still had some doubts on whether this executive order, and that's what it was, could survive an appeal, an appeal that ultimately might go to whom? Chief Justice Roger Tawney, residing in Maryland, very pro-South. He, he had already written memos expecting appeals on the draft, the first draft in American history. He would be against it. He had a memo against emancipation. That was in his desk drawer. So Lincoln was worried. I, I don't think Lincoln knew about the memoranda, but, but he was concerned about what the Supreme Court would do uh, if this uh, proclamation, if this executive order reached the Supreme Court of the United States. So here you have a president and commander in chief who's surrounded by all of this pressure, this stress. The war is going on. It's not doing exactly well in 1862 with the Peninsula Campaign with Second Manassas, uh, and what saved the day, uh, as um, Bud and Harold indicated, was what the North could conceive as a victory at Antietam, giving reason, giving Lincoln the reason to issue um, this document five days later on the 22nd as the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. What, one thing that, that impresses me and that that one should take note. If you read the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, the one that was issued 150 years ago tomorrow, th there's a very weak basis upon which Lincoln is relying, saying that on January 1, 1863, if those states still in rebellion have not returned to the Union, then those uh, slaves still in those states in rebellion will be forever free. He bases it on the, the Second Confiscation Act, 
which Congress had passed. So you've got a, you've got a pressure between the Congress and the President over the issue of uh, slavery and emancipation. He also bases it on an earlier act in March 1862, which requires union officers not to return escaped slaves who've gone into union lines. So he's under, he's under this pressure. That, that second confiscation act required Lincoln to issue a warning to southern states still in rebellion. And that preliminary emancipation proclamation was in part a warning to those Confederate states so-called. The other thing that I find immensely important and interesting is that the preliminary emancipation proclamation still talks about colonization. That to Lincoln and many others in the early Whig party, uh, supporters of Henry Clay, wanted to resolve this problem by having these African Americans return to their home countries, although most of them had been born in the United States. And secondly, it made no mention, this is the preliminary proclamation now, no mention of military service by African Americans. This is big. This is big. So by the time January 1 comes and he issues this proclamation, there's no mention of colonization. And now blacks are invited to serve in the United States military forces. And Edna will, I think, describe in great detail what a great contribution that was to the war effort. 10% of the whole Union force were African Americans by war, war's end, a significant number. And, and it's funny, Lincoln didn't want to arm the blacks at, at first. The, the final proclamation says, shall receive into service blacks to what? Garrison forts and posts? Not to be armed. And it didn't take long for them to go from garrison soldiers to combat soldiers. So that, that, that was a progressive, a progressive move, move just as Lincoln was evolving through the entire war on the way he felt towards slavery, the institution, on how he grew as a commander in chief uh, in an effort to save or consider us one, one nation. And I know you have a couple of other pictures you wanted to uh, talk about. Um, well, we've got yeah, this. Well, this, this is the carpenter uh, painting that, that Harold indicated the original is in the is in the well of the of the US Senate this this um, is a great print showing a member of the US colored troops so-called uh, visiting uh, his home and reading the Emancipation Proclamation uh, why should as Lincoln would say why should they do anything for us if we do nothing for them and I, th I think it's a great example of, of just what a transformative action this, this act was. Edna, Virginia born and raised, Charles Absolutely. City County, yes. uh, educated at a historically black academic institution, Hampton mm -hmm. Institute, attended Absolutely. the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. and now a professor at Howard University. Talk to us about some of the images you're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to return to uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, two clauses in the proclamation. One is, it, and it comes near the end of the final proclamation on January 1st, 1863, and it says, and I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. Now, enslaved people uh, may not have known that that was in the final proclamation, but whether they did or not, they did not adhere to that directive. Historians have uh, for years suggested that African Americans sat along the sidelines and allowed white men to fight a war that freed them. In reality, African Americans participated uh, wholeheartedly in that war and helped to win it. Uh, what they're doing, uh, they, are, they are not abstaining from violence. Uh, let me give 
Charles City is an example of what enslaved people are doing there after the proclamation. Uh, there is an instance, once the U.S. colored troops had been formed and the Union Army is coming through that area, uh, people, of course, are liberated. And uh, there is uh, the Africa Brigade uh, under uh, Commander Wild, Colonel Wild, and he encounters three women who had been apparently horribly abused in slavery by a man named William Clopton who was a very prominent slaveholder in the county. And so he gave the women the opportunity to beat this man, to um, seek revenge on uh, the behavior that he had exhibited uh, while these women were enslaved. And so they proceeded to do so. Uh, that certainly is not abstaining from violence. There were examples as well of men in Louisiana and Mississippi who commandeered horses and seized uh, firearms and actually were uh, riding through the countryside, terrorizing the local population. So much so that women begged the local Confederate commanders to return their overseers to the plantations because um, the enslaved population, the newly freed people, were uh, getting out of hand. And also in Charles City County, uh, when the Union Army first came through on one particular plantation, uh, Sandy Point Plantation, where there were 180 enslaved people, uh, something very unusual in that part of Virginia, or in Virginia at all. I mean, that's something that's very common in cotton-producing in, in, uh, cotton areas and also in sugar-producing areas, but generally not in tobacco-producing areas or areas where there was um, mixed farming, which is, which is what was the case in Charles City by that time. But when they saw the Union Army coming, uh, of course, their owners fled because their owners were a part of the Confederacy. They, they had aided the Confederacy. And so they fled, leaving um, some of their enslaved laborers behind and refugeeing those that were the most important, meaning moving them out of the way of the Union Army so that they wouldn't join up. And so when the army arrived, these African Americans, knowing the pattern of the army, whether they were Confederate troops or Union troops, uh, knowing that they would appropriate whatever property was valuable to them, decided that they were not going to give up their owner's valuables uh, freely. So they hid the valuables, and then they negotiated a deal with the Union Army. So they sold the goods to the Army. So they showed uh, a keen knowledge of capitalism, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, this was their unique way of, um, of resisting, at least, any attempt to um, sort of keep them in check, even if the Union Army uh, was there. So you have that kind of, Lincoln, on the one hand, is talking about people you know, working for wages and kind of you know, don't, don't get out of hand. But that's exactly what they're doing. And they're doing so perhaps most successfully when they are joining the Union Army. Uh, that second part, the second clause I'd like to focus on is the one that Frank has introduced uh, about garrisoning forts and, and um, manning ships and so forth. So uh, inviting them to join the Army and the Navy. Well, before the war is over, there are upwards of 100, 180 to 200,000 African American men who serve uh, either in the Union Army or the Navy. 130,000 of them are Southern men, most of them enslaved. And they're joining the 50,000 from the North who are donning uh, the, the Union blue. And so these men help to win the war. They distinguish themselves at Chaffin's Farm and uh, Battle of the Crater in Virginia. They're at uh, Port Hudson, Louisiana. They're at Milliken's Bend near Vicksburg. They're at Morris Island uh, where the Fort Wagner, the famous Fort Wagner uh, battle occurred. So they are involved in at least 400 battles, 39 of them very important ones. And so they're right there helping to win the war. Lincoln understood the contribution that they were making and indicated that it was one of the most important things that was done during the war to help the Union cause. These men 
having served, believed that the, the country owed them something, that in addition to getting their freedom, they were entitled to full citizenship. And the way they defined that was access to the voting polls, land acquisition, they wanted to be independent farmers because most of these men are in the South, and if you're going to be successful in the South, you had to own land at that time. They wanted education for themselves and for their children, and they wanted fair treatment. And they believed that in issuing the proclamation, that's what Lincoln was offering to them. And so the first generation of freed men and women came to revere Lincoln, not just because the proclamation promised freedom, but because they believed that the proclamation also promised full equality. When they didn't receive that equality, as the years passed and the, the Jim Crow laws set in, I mean, there was a time during Reconstruction where it seemed like they were going to get the rights that they wanted. But after that time, when these rigid laws were put into effect and the discrimination became entrenched and was even supported by the national government under the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, with Plessy versus Ferguson, they became very disillusioned. And with that dis disillusionment came a, a kind of, um, certainly the reverence for Lincoln was no longer there, and they began to question the proclamation as well. As early as the 1880s, Frederick Douglass was calling the proclamation a stupendous failure. He, he didn't blame Lincoln for it, but he blamed the nation. He believed that the nation owed a debt to African Americans because of the service they had provided the nation. African Americans believed that having sacrificed all, they were entitled, and so they didn't get what they were looking for. And so that kind of, of um, that disconnect with Lincoln and the proclamation, I think, still permeates African American thought in some areas of the country today. But when I discuss this issue with friends and relatives, the first question that comes up is, was anyone freed immediately? Absolutely. For so long, historians have argued that not a single enslaved person was freed immediately by the proclamation, that it was necessary for the enslaved to either make their way to the Union lines or to wait until the Army came through or the Navy came through and liberated them. But we do know that approximately 50,000 people got their freedom immediately because Union troops were in the vicinity or in areas like the Sea Island, you know, where they had already been liberated. That area, uh, Lincoln could have, because the Union Army is there, Lincoln could have said, okay, you're, you're exempted and you're going to remain enslaved, but they were already freed because of the Confiscation Acts and so forth. Go ahead, Harold. I, it's an interesting question, and, and, and Edna is, of course, right. This is something that's been debated with increased vigor over the last years, and the tide seems to be inexplicably and, I think, unjustifiably turning back toward this notion that actually I learned in, when I was in grade school looking at pictures of Lincoln on the wall as well, that the proclamation freed nobody, that it only affected areas over which Lincoln had no control and did nothing in areas over which he did have control, um, where, by the way, constitutionally he had no authority to invoke the war power. In truth, not only, in, in my view, would the 50,000 people immediately freed with the signature, but over the course of the next two years, until the 13th, well, until Maryland uh, initiates its own uh, state emancipation and other states begin to follow, I think about 500,000 enslaved people were freed because the Union Army is always on the march and where the Union Army goes, either enslaved people rush to the lines or the Army t lit literally frees people in their wake. Uh, think of Sherman's march, marching through and liberating people and, and doing whatever else one thing Sherman did on the march. Um, I compare it to, and as Frank mentioned, the comparisons to the Declaration of Independence. It was compared to the Declaration of Independence in its own day as this, the second Declaration of Independence, the one that would write 
the wrongs correct the hypocrisy of the first, which promised equality for all men but didn't, but didn't produce it. But the Declaration of Independence did not create a nation out of 13 colonies the day it was issued. Nothing happened on July 4th, 1776, except that the Declaration was issued. It still had to be fought for over the next numbers of years, and that's exactly the case with the Second Declaration of Independence. Frank? On, on this issue on whether or not the, the proclamation freed anyone, when Edna began her, her short presentation, she gave anecdotes about what blacks were doing in the context of taking the law in their own hands or protecting themselves, which is evidence right there of freedom. Uh, there are specific examples when you, the Union forces moved inland and reached farms and plantations that had slaves, and there were old crusty slave owners refusing to follow the Emancipation Proclamation. Those slave owners were tried by military commission and incarcerated. And the numbers are elusive. It could be as high as 500,000. It could be between 250,000 and 500,000 that were actually freed through the movement of the Union Army and Navy. But clearly, clearly, uh, they, th this proclamation went a long way towards emancipation, actual emancipation. And th the other thing that we shouldn't forget is when the black man found out on the telegraph, the grape line, whatever, that there was a government in Washington that was advocating a policy of freedom, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to walk and run and move as quickly as they can into Union lines. Now, this all started early in the war before the emancipation, and that's when we get into that, that label contrabands, which contraband, which comes from General Butler at Fort Monroe, and what to do with these, with these um, uh, African Americans and their families that, that escaped into Union lines, and they, the, the, the government in Washington really didn't know what to do with them, but they, it, that evolved, that changed in putting them to work and dressing them and, and feeding them. So this, this whole movement towards freedom had started long before Lincoln's preliminary emancipation proclamation on September, on September 22. If I, if I may add something, um, we have to keep in mind too that not everyone's leaving the plantation or farm and even those who are leaving sometimes return. So we forget that it's a two-way street. It's not just people going to the union lines and remaining there, they go to the union lines they decide they don't like the Union soldiers too much because they aren't always treated that well. So they come back to the plantations and they raise hell while they're there and, and they're tearing down the system along the way. So even those people who remain in place erode the system. So it could have never been returned to what it was before because African Americans had decided at the very beginning of the war that this was their opportunity to be free. And they were taking it even before the proclamation. The proclamation gives them the license, so to speak, to even go at it more because you've got the most powerful man in the government saying you are free to leave. And they take advantage of it, but they don't always do that. They stay there and they erode the system in place. Just, just one quick word about the clause that you started with, because I, thinking about the context, the, that, that strange clause in which Lincoln advises against violence, advise, advises slaves to commit no violence, I think I, I know the explanation for that, or I have one explanation for it. And remember, there are, there's a July 22nd proclamation, a September 22nd, and a January 1st. The September 22nd proclamation comes out, and one of the good effects of it, as, as far as Lincoln is concerned, is that it's going to halt the challenge to uh, the, the movement in England to recognize the Confederacy, which is very dangerous. If England declares that the blockade is a violation of international law and recognizes the Confederacy, there could be a world war, which would doom the, the effort to restore the Union and engulf the country in, in two wars at once. What is, Lincoln thinks that the proclamation will have a salutary effect in England because they are 
a more freedom-loving people. They have committed against, against slavery much earlier. What happens? The government takes to the floor of Parliament and says that Lincoln is inciting a race war. The London Times attacks leading Lincoln for fomenting a servile rebellion. So I think that Lincoln put that clause in the final proclamation to demonstrate that that wasn't his intention. Well, he absolutely hoped that slaves were going to be part of the army, either official or unofficial, that was going to end slavery. Absolutely. If this is done by because of military necessity, why would you want them to sit of quietly course. and do nothing? Of course you want them to rise up, yeah. not necessarily kill their owners well, until you get them into the army, mind you, right. and then you do it legally. But you, you want them to cause chaos mm -hmm. in the South, and you want them to not work because African Americans were still continuing to grow the food that the army ate. They were still growing the cotton. They were being impressed into a service as military laborers uh, for the Confederacy. So they were throwing up breastworks. They were working in the munitions factories. They were absolutely critical to the Southern cause in that regard. And so if you could separate them, from that, then it was perfect for the Union. Frank, we know this is a highly legalistic document. We, we understand the reasons for it, but I think one of the audience members suggested in a question that a slave is a slave. Why weren't all of the slaves freed? Because we had four states in the North that were slave states that stayed in the North, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, and Kentucky. And it's a great question. Woody, because counterbalancing what the three of us said here, have said here, is the fact that Lincoln was worried about those four northern slave states. He did not want them to leave the Union and join the Confederacy. And this is why he offered colonization, compensated emancipation, paying the slave owners for the value or a value for the slave, and because the Constitution, until the 13th Amendment, protected slavery. And slavery was a state institution. And when, when uh, his own Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, after the proclamation became effective on January 1, it exempted certain areas in the South already under Union occupation, Chase wanted Lincoln to remove those exemptions. And Lincoln said, no, I, I based this proclamation on the legal grounds that I could do this as commander in chief as a military measure. The Confederate states still belong to the Union. I've never recognized that they've seceded. And they, cert they have certain rights. One of those rights was slavery. And that's another reason, in addition to his fear for an appeal from the issuance of an executive order, to our Supreme Court that he pushed for and supported assiduously the 13th Amendment, which would abolish slavery throughout the, throughout the United States. So he, he, he had a rational basis for acting this way, even though it seems inconsistent both in the South and in those northern, those northern slave states. And another question that comes up, Edna, from time to time is, were there blacks who assisted the Confederacy in terms of actually taking up arms and fighting against the Union? We know that uh, the Native Guard of New Orleans uh, certainly uh, offered their services to the Confederacy. These were men of standing and property. These, some of these men uh, were slave owners themselves. Uh, they were, um, for the most part, mulattoes in New Orleans. They did offer their services, but when the Confederacy left the area and invited them to come along, they declined. And so, apparently, they were not really an official part of the Confederacy. When the Union Army arrived, they offered their services to the Union Army. And this is an example of what people are doing during this period. They're doing whatever is necessary to survive. We have to keep in mind that the Confederacy is impressing black men. They are impressing enslaved men against the wishes of their owners, by the way, and against the wishes of the various states. And they are impressing free black men. 
So what they're doing is they're forcing these men to work for the Confederacy to throw up breastworks. They're not impressing them to serve in the military as soldiers or as sailors. Now they do implement a policy of um, enlistment of black men near the end of the war, but it is so late, nothing can be done to help the Confederacy at this point, and these men do not see combat as I understand it. They are drilling, they are formed into companies. This is um, in the last year of the war, this is sometime in the spring of 1865, but these men do not see combat. We know that 186,000 African American men served on the side of the Union, 25 of them received the Medal of Honor, 18 of them from the, from the Army and seven from the Navy. So, you know, whether or not there were a few black men who supported the Confederacy, a few in Petersburg did, we know that overwhelmingly black people supported the Union. Go ahead, Harold. I, I think we, we have to acknowledge that there is a, I don't know what, whether you'd call it an urban myth or this growing um, underground idea that there were a substantial number of, um, of African-American troops serving the Confederacy. And if you read popular Civil War newspapers and magazines, you see spirited, uh, insistent defenses of this uh, repeatedly. And I know here in Virginia it's a sensitive topic, but a few years ago one of your uh, elementary school textbooks contained the assertion that African-American troops served under Stonewall Jackson. And the author was asked how she found that reference, and she said she found it on the internet. And there was a major dust-up about that. There is no evidence that I've ever seen that a substantial number of African-American troops served in the Confederacy willingly. If, they, if some did, to, a scattered number of people did to save their own lives, it's no different than, than Jewish people who became concentration camp guards in some horrible perversion of justice and morality, and, and it's all about survival. But and the idea that African Americans defended the Confederacy is just not true. Frank, can you give us a sense of the political environment once the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued? Also, what was going on in terms of the stock, the stock market? Was Lincoln worried about his government falling? Lincoln was worried about many things. The, the, how this would affect his soldiers in the field, because many, and they would say this vociferously after the issuance of the proclamation, we didn't fight to free African Americans. We fought to save the Union or for reunification. He was worried about that. Uh, he was worried about people like General McClellan, very popular with the troops, who who really was not for emancipation. Uh, he was worried about the congressional elections that would come after the issuance of the preliminary proclamation tomorrow, 150 years. He lost, his party lost 28 House seats attributable to his issuance of the proclamation. He was certainly worried about the gold and the sale of gold and bonds, and, and although that worked well, I think, economically. They worried about the border states, as we indicated earlier, and what their reaction would be, because none of them would take him up on his offer of compensated emancipation for their slaves. So all of this, all of this was weighing on Lincoln's mind. And you can imagine the Democrats were very much opposed to emancipation, and the Democratic newspapers really uh, hit Lincoln hard for his issuance of, of the preliminary proclamation. Uh, it was less so after the final proclamation on January 1, but all of this was, was uh, having an effect on Lincoln, and as Harold indicated, a big concern over, over England and France, although that issuance of the proclamation really kept them out because it garnered support of many of the Englishmen and Frenchmen on, uh, on what, this, what this president had done. I want to the take, go ahead, go it's ahead. It's interesting that there's a difference between how 
the various, how the European governments respond and how the people respond. Right. Because the government leaders thought Lincoln had lost his mind. Mm -hmm. But, and the elites had the same impression. But the people were so much behind him. So he gets a letter from the Working Men's Association of Manchester, England, praising him for what he has done. Because these people are wedded to a free labor system. But their governments certainly were not. Now, what about Lincoln's cabinet before and after the issuance of the proclamation? Were they consistently uh, behind him? Let, let's put, put that slide up, Harold, of the carpenter painting. Well, we'll have to and go we back can, to we can, uh, number 19. 19. 19, if they can show it. We'll get there. Well, we, we, had, we had all different, Lincoln had all different views from his cabinet members. Some were for it. For example, his attorney general, Bates uh, that you see on the far right from Missouri uh, was for emancipation as long as it was coupled with colonization, deportation. And the other extreme, and this, this is a shocker, Sam and Chase, one of the biggest abolitionists that ever served in the United States Senate, governor of Ohio, was opposed to Lincoln's act of emancipation. Seward, uh, as was indicated early, the Secretary of State, he's sitting in the front of Bates, second from the right. Hand seated. in his coat, that's the yeah, easiest way. Hand in his coat, uh, was okay with it, but was strongly urging, deferring until there was a union victory. So there were differing, there were differing opinions. That's why timing was another factor in all of this. And Lincoln was a master at, at coming as close to the right time uh, as, as possible before he made such a judgment or, he, or issued such a, an act. To you know, when, he, when he held the July 22nd meeting, which this painting um, evokes, I think he was pretty surprised and pretty disappointed that uh, he didn't get any support in the cabinet that day. Um, and he's, you know, um, Bates and Blair, Blair particularly, Montgomery Blair, he's there somewhere, to the second from the right, said, you're going to absolutely kill the party in the November elections. That was his argument. Lincoln said that's not important. Um, colonization, Bates said he'll take care of it. But they basically, uh, Seward then says, there's no victory, so you can't do it. You have to do it from a position of, strength or it'll seem like an act of desperation, or as Lincoln later called it, the Pope's bull against the comet. Uh, the Pope, Pope Calixtus had issued a papal bull saying that Halley's comet may not appear in the sky. And of course the next day it appeared in the sky. Lincoln didn't want his proclamation to be like that. So on September 22nd, 150 years ago tomorrow, picture Abraham Lincoln take bringing his cabinet together, the same group of people, and this is what he says to them. Well, first he reads from a joke book because he wants to break the tension. And Stanton, the grim Secretary of War on the left, is a little bit irritated. He's not a big fan of humor, especially dialect humor, which Lincoln delivers with great relish, laughing. He's always his best audience, Lincoln is. And then Lincoln gets very solemn and there are two cabinet members recording this in their, in their diaries. And he says to them, you remember that um, two months ago I came before you and I told you about my plans and you gave me some reasons. I made a pact with God that if McClellan should turn back Lee in Maryland, I will issue this proclamation. And now the issue is decided. And in those days, presidents took issues to the cabinet and took votes. And if there was a majority against a policy, the president usually didn't act. Lincoln took no vote. He had consulted God, and that was how he got past the cabinet objections on September 22nd. I want to read one of the uh, questions that has been submitted by the audience. Brigadier General Jack Mountcast Mountcastle asked, if General McClellan had defeated Confederate forces defending Richmond in June 1862 and captured the Confederate capital, the Civil War may have ended soon thereafter. Would President Lincoln have felt the need to emancipate slaves in the southern states? Well, I, I, I'll start. Uh, I think it's uh, 
almost counterintuitive. I think by that time, by the Peninsula Campaign, Link, uh, Lincoln had realized that to deal with the war and to achieve victory, we had to deal with the slave question. And if, if there had been a victory on the peninsula, uh, it may have deferred, perhaps, um, the issuance of the proclamation, the preliminary proclamation. But I think at some point it, it, during the war, uh, it would have issued. Uh, I don't think the, a victory on the peninsula would have ended the war either because of all the other theaters of operation and the resilience of the Confederate government, so-called. We, we know that the war occurred because of slavery, but it did not occur because either side cared about African Americans, okay? There was no real desire, there was no desire to wage war to free black people. But once the war occurred, Lincoln understood fairly quickly that in order to make certain that this didn't happen again, that there wasn't this opportunity or reason for there to be disunion, something had to be done about slavery. And so emancipation was the byproduct of that. I'm, I'll just play the contrarian here. Um, and my contrary view is that Lincoln was innately cautious. And how long would the war have lasted? We don't know. But I think he would have deferred for a long time until he had another moment, desperation followed by victory. That's a unique set of circumstances. Remember, the only time Abraham Lincoln sets a date, in his own words, on the end of slavery in America, the date is 1900. He says that, in this is before the 13th Amendment, but in his special message to Congress in 1862, when he says, please do compensated emancipation in the rest of the country, it's the only way out, he says by 1900. It's astonishing, but that's the only time he ever mentioned the 20th century in his life. So I don't know. He was willing to wait that long. Well, and, and well, he wouldn't have been there to do sure. it. Yes. <laughs> well, we're not even sure that that's a real date, that, that slavery would have, because Lincoln believed it would have died out by 1900. But absent a war, I'm not sure that that would have been correct. But he's, given, he's giving Delaware the opportunity to do something very gradual. He's giving yes. them two choices. He's saying you can either do it by 1867 or you can prolong it. You can free a few people mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. right. And so he was willing to consign an entire generation of people to continued right. enslavement if it meant Preserving and, and Alexander yes. Stevens insists at Fortress Mon that at the at the peace conference in uh, March, February, 1865, that Lincoln offered six years to Georgia, which Lincoln's people later say he was six months. Stevens misheard him, but so there's an instinct to unify white people and defer if necessary. Although I agree with Frank's first premise is and yours, Edna's, is that once. That, that once the war starts, slavery is doomed, and he's just going to corral it in one way or another. But he had always favored gradualism. Yes. From the very beginning, he never believed in that everything. the emancipation should be immediate. And exactly. the compensation, yes. and the use of... Mm -hmm. right. And, and, right. and not, he says it's and cheaper, not, to, cheaper for me to buy right. our slaves than to wave the war is costing a million dollars a day. A million a day in those dollars, and not one slave in the border states was ever manumitted or freed with compensation. The only compensation that worked was in the District of Columbia right. mm -hmm. in 1862 when there was a stipend paid for every, for every slave and, and they gained their freedom. But not to every slave. Let's make sure. No, not, not, to, not to, to every slave. Every slave yeah, owner. It's a going slave to owner. the slave owner, not to the enslaved right. person. <laughs> so what do we tell the audience the real reason for the Civil War is? Was it actually to maintain the Union or was it to free the slaves or was it a combination? Well, it becomes a combination. Well, let's, my view is you start with the premise the war, secession occurs because of slavery. The war be, occurs because of secession. And the end result is a war to restore the Union and destroy slavery. Frank? I, I, I'll buy that. And Lincoln was the catalyst, the black Republican who was elected in November 1860 and brought all of this together. Mm -hmm. 
but with the assistance of African Americans as well. Absolutely. Because from the very beginning of the war, African Americans are running away. They are causing a problem for the Union Army because they don't know what to do with all of these people. And although Lincoln is not formulating policy early on about these people, some of his generals are. And so when you have large numbers of people running away, the system is already being eroded. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, that's a really interesting point, and it seems to me that the, the government had a huge challenge in dealing with the slaves who were now freed. Where were they kept, and under what conditions? Lincoln um, was a commuter president for about six months a year in 1862, 3, and 4. He lived in an elaborate cottage northwest of Washington called the, the Soldier's Home which was an active soldier's retirement home founded by, created by Jefferson Davis, interestingly, when he was Secretary of War. And on his trips back into town, because he wrote to the White House every day to, like a commuter, he would see um, contraband camps, as they were called, places where people who had emancipated themselves had gathered and were living together in horrific, horrific conditions. There's been a new study now that suggests that the, the, um, the death toll usually ascribed to the Civil War, 620,000, needs to be increased by 130,000 to the you know, mind-boggling figure of at least 750, because the 620 doesn't take into account the diseases, the deaths by disease that, that what occurred in these contraband camps. So, but Lincoln is going by, and he's seeing the camps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And who is the one who comes to him and says, you've got to do something, you've got to raise money for blankets, and you've got to contribute so that there are blankets for these people because they have no shelter, is his wife, who is, of course, being, being accused of being um, um, pro-Confederate at the same time. But Mary Lincoln starts a campaign to get money from her husband for blankets. And he makes a small contribution. And, and of course, she's being um, influenced by her dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley, who is the president of the Contraband Relief Association. Mm -hmm. But also, too, there are a few exceptions to the horrific conditions. Most of them are living in horrific conditions. But there are a few contraband camps that are quite interesting in, in terms of what they have to provide for the people there. One is Freedman's Village. Uh, the, the contraband camp that was settled on the confiscated property of Robert E. Lee. And another was in Corinth, Mississippi. Those were model camps where people built their own homes and they had shops and a hospital and they were taught to be self-sufficient and so forth. Not that they didn't already know those things, but there is this this uh, attitude on the part of Northerners that African Americans have to be taught how to be free. Right. The, the camps are no more squalid than army camps right. because everybody right. suffers from the same misunderstanding of basic sanitary conditions. They use, they put their waste places too close to the drinking water. So typhoid is rampant in Confederate camps, Union camps, and contraband camps. So they don't have to be taught. Everybody suffered from the right. same delusions about sanitation and germs and things like that. Frank, there were obvious economic consequences uh, during the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation. How did free blacks in the North, immigrants in the North, and poor whites react to the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, there, there was tension because of a fear that this was another consideration in the, in the equation, the whole equation on the issue of when and how emancipation would occur on this new fo labor force competing for jobs uh, in the North by immigrants and, and, other, uh, and others. And uh, that, was, that remained, as Edna pointed out uh, earlier, that, re that would remain long after the war itself and would lead to a, a, an almost re-enslavement with the Jim, Jim Crow laws despite efforts to ameliorate with a Civil Rights Act with the, after the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment that was to give rights to, uh, to all Americans, but especially African Americans, and the 15th Amendment, with, which was the right to vote. All of the, these were efforts 
but never, never enforced really for, for African Americans. And this is why they became, I think, so disengaged. And they were kept down and, and as farmers. They were kept in place in the South to really prevent them from migrating to, um, to the North, all in part because of this, this economics. Go ahead. To the immigrant question, I think you can drill down and be fairly specific about it, and that the German American population, and remember that Union Army and the Confederate Army have a lot of foreign accents in them. There are a lot of Irish Americans in the Union Navy and uh, in the Confederate Navy, a lot of Irish Americans and German Americans in the Union Army. German Americans are basically refugees from the revolutions of 1848 and they're progressives on, and anti-slavery. So I think they welcome um, emancipation exultantly. You can see it in the literature. Um, I think it's less so among Irish Americans, uh, not to you know, point fingers, but you know, in my own city, New York City, the reaction to uh, emancipation was, was angry, although somewhat muted, but it exploded a, a couple of days after the Battle of Gettysburg when um, the first draft names were pulled from wheels uh, in downtown Manhattan and riots erupted all over Manhattan, violent, bloody riots that are always called the draft riots, but in fact were race riots. Uh, atrocities committed against people of color. Murder, lynchings, sexual mutilation, destruction of homes, destruction of small businesses, driving people out of communities, mixed communities. So there was a violent, specific violent Irish American, principally Irish American outrage against the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a tragic and horrific moment in, in American life, but it occurred. But the response of free blacks in the North to the proclamation is interesting because even though they're living in societies without slavery in the North, they still don't have the same rights as other Americans. And so they see this proclamation as a beginning for them. They understand that as long as slavery exists in the country, their, their lives are never going to be able to get any better either. But if slavery can end, then there's opportunity for them. So that's why you have 50,000 free men in the North going to war, not just to free enslaved people, but to free themselves, yeah. to get certain kinds of rights for themselves. So what the proclamation does is, it really gives them an incentive to fight hard to get those rights while the war is still going on. So for instance, you have in Pennsylvania, both uh, the effort to get voting rights. You also have this um, struggle against the streetcars because the streetcars are segregated and African Americans aren't allowed to ride in the interior of the cars. And so they're fighting for that. They're fighting for public school access for their children. They're, uh, uh, they're, they're fighting for better jobs. They're fighting for equality of access in terms of public accommodations. So this proclamation is tremendously important to them as well. And Frederick uh, Douglass says, if you give a black man a uniform, his rights can never be denied again. Absolutely. Not, didn't happen that way, but that was what his advice was mm -hmm. when he wrote his famous recruiting, to arms, to arms, mm -hmm. um, recruiting advice. And what was Lincoln's opinion uh, regarding the right to vote for freed slaves? Well, you know, Lincoln had, had said, we, we always remember the 1858 uh, debates with Stephen A. Douglas when Lincoln was running for the Senate, and he said some very uncomplimentary things about African Americans, and it talked about never being in, in favor of voting rights or political rights or, or social equality for African Americans. Interestingly enough, though, three days before the assassination, he does his final public address in which he's calling for political rights, voting rights for certain segments of the African American population. Those men who had served the nation as military men and those he called uh, the more intelligent. He was actually talking about those men from New Orleans and from some other areas who were educated. Interestingly enough, no one's calling for white men to be. You know, no one's saying we're not going to allow white men uh, to vote unless they are 
considered the, among the most intelligent. Frank John Wilkes Booth, according to myth, right. hears that last speech and says, that means Negro equality, and he doesn't use the word Negro. That's the last speech he'll ever make. I'll put him through now. Frank, here's another interesting question from the audience submitted by Brenda King. Given today's political environment, could the Emancipation Proclamation happen now? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't much better in Lincoln's day uh, with a, a Congress, even without any Southern representation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He had his own conflicts with, within his own body. The conservatives like Blair that, uh, that uh, Harold discussed and the radicals that, that thought Lincoln wasn't moving fast enough on the issue of freedom. But remember, this was a presidential order. This didn't come from the Congress. The Congress was applying pressure with the confiscation acts, with, uh, with, uh, with other acts that, that would prohibit the return of slaves. Uh, so I think if, if the stars and the sun were aligned and this was the, this was the issue, the, the touchstone, and we had a president with the great political courage of Lincoln, I think it could happen. So this, this was more like the executive order issued by uh, President Truman integrating the, the armed forces? Yes. There is a modern analog, though. I mean, it, obviously, red and blue states are not as volatile as blue and gray states, even though we all think we're living through the most volatile time ever. But, you know, the modern analog, I think, is, uh, is the immigration relief for young people that President Obama ordered. The DREAM Act. The DREAM Act. You know, didn't, the DREAM Act didn't work in Congress, so he issued an executive order. I don't know if anybody's going to challenge it in court, but he issued it, and it was a presidential proclamation. Here's another question submitted by Tony Nicosa. Was anyone ever held accountable for a violation of the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, Edna talked yes, about that. Yes, yes. Um, what's interesting is when you've got Missouri and Kentucky, for instance, are exempted from the proclamation because they're border states. They're still in the Union. And so when African Americans leave places like Mississippi and they enter places like Missouri and Kentucky, sometimes they are re-enslaved. An example of that happens um, in, I believe it's Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken, could be Missouri, who knows, the brain's not working today. But um, there's a man named Fountain Brown who actually is brought up on charges because he re-enslaves these people and he tries to sell them to Texas. And Joseph Holt, who is a friend of Lincoln, becomes involved in that case. I don't believe that Brown ever actually went to prison for it, but he was charged, and I believe he had gone through at least one trial. So it does happen. People are re-enslaved. In terms of um, people not allowing um, enslaved people to leave once the proclamation is issued, there are instances all over the South where slaveholders are just ignoring the proclamation. But when the Union Army comes into the vicinity, these people are forced to allow these folk to go, or they're told that they have to pay them now. They have to pay them wages. Tell us, about, tell us about the Lincoln League. Oh, that's, someone had asked about, uh, I think Frank, you may have, have talked about the slave grapevine right. and how they found out about the Emancipation Proclamation. In some areas of the South, there was an organized group called the Lincoln Legal Loyal League. And so these were enslaved people who went from plantation to plantation, letting the folk know that they were free. And so once they told this group, then that group went out and told other people. A lot of times enslaved people knew about the, about the uh, proclamation even before their, their owners did. Uh, it's fascinating how quickly the news is sent out through the enslaved community. Frank, another question from the audience submitted by R.C. Fonger. Why was there a delay from September 1862 to January 1863 between the announcement and the effective date of the proclamation? It's a good question. The, as I indicated earlier, the, the preliminary emancipation proclamation in addition to its timing, in addition to 
coming after Antietam uh, was a warning that Congress wanted to give to the people of the South in the Second Confiscation Act that if you had not returned, you were no longer in rebellion, you were going to lose this property. And that was part of the interregnum between the 22nd of September and 100 days later on January 1. Plus, I think, politically, Lincoln wanted this to also prepare the North uh, and his troops on what was going to happen on January 1. Clearly, the Confederate states were not going to come back into the Union, whether it was 100 days or 100,000 days. And I think this was his way, too, of easing into uh, that, final, that final step on the 1st of January. And Harold, a, a question from Doug Redding. Since the proclamation proclaimed freedom of slaves only in the 10 states, 11 maybe, in rebellion, do you feel it was politically motivated? Didn't Lincoln say, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it? And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it? And if I could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. I spent a lot of time parsing that sentence. It's part of a letter that Lincoln wrote exactly between the preliminary, the draft and the preliminary. August 22nd, 1862, he writes a letter to the editor, to Horace Greeley, the, um, who has published an editorial in the New York Tribune condemning the administration for being what he called strangely and disastrously remiss on emancipation. And Lincoln writes this elaborate defense of his position and says his paramount object is to save the Union, as you say, as Doug says, is it Doug? Yes. That if I could free some slaves, I would save the Union by freeing some, I would do that. Um, what I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because it helps to save the Union. All of that has to be taken, I think, with something of a grain of salt because Lincoln has already written the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation when he writes that letter. And all of these elaborate obfusc obfuscatory um, things that he declares between July and September are meant in his mind to prepare a, you know, a racist white America for the inevitability of emancipation. He's very fearful of it, as Frank has said. He's fearful of the political reaction. But he's setting the stage. Did he do it perfectly? No. Did he do it clumsily? Occasionally. Did he do it offensively? At least once. But he really felt that his government was in peril unless he made it a non-benevolent, non-philanthropic emancipation in the public mind. Now, we have a plethora of media that we have to deal with today. Uh, in, it, it's advanced, it keeps advancing. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have emails, uh, uh, we have all the major newspapers uh, on the internet. Uh, we have C-SPAN, we have Fox News, we have CNBC. Uh, to what extent was Lincoln bombarded by editorials uh, and other tools used to influence him? Well, this, well, he, this is what a, I'm working uh, on. Harold now, yeah. should go first because he's working on that very book. I, I, I did a book a few years ago called The New York Times Complete Civil War. And um, President Clinton had, uh, was visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art where I work. And I thought, this is a great opportunity. I said, Mr. President, you know, you should write the introduction to this book because nobody knows more about dealing with the modern media than you. Might as well compliment him you know, and try to get him to do it. And he said, you know, you're absolutely right. I really do know about that stuff. And he said, you know, um, the media was, I shouldn't do my Clinton imitation. Right? The media was very political um, in those days. They were either Democratic or Republican. And everything a Democrat said was attacked by the Republicans. Everything a Republican said was attacked by the Democrats. Having a story printed overnight, which became uh, commonplace in the Civil War era because of the Telegraph, was as momentous to people having a battle reported overnight as a Twitter feed or a Facebook or, you know, Governor Romney doing something that was captured on somebody's cell phone and going out virally. That was viral in the Civil War era and very, very partisan. So President Clinton's final comment was, you know, MSNBC and Fox are just like 
the opposition papers of the Civil War era. It's just that MSNBC and Fox won't admit it. In the, in the Civil War era, the New York Times said they were the Republican paper, and the New York World said they were the Democratic paper. And it was so in every city. Even in your benign city of Providence, there were two papers. Now, and and um, Lincoln knew this, and he knew how to use them, and that's why his letters uh, on the issue of procl emancipation proclamation to a lawyer friend in Springfield, Illinois, James Conkling, he intended it to be read at a mass rally and then distributed nationally by telegraph reports and made into pamphlets as he did with the Corning letter relating to civil liberties. So he knew, he knew the- He knew the, how to work it. How to work it and he, he was a, an effective communicator writing most of his own stuff and he got it out there. He, he knew how to get it out to, to the public. By the way, with Greeley, I love this aspect of the story. That letter to the editor, my paramount object is to save the union. He was rather irked at Greeley because he, Greeley was a pro-link, you know, pro-anti-slavery, pro-Republican editor. So when he wrote this brilliant letter to the editor, he gave it to another newspaper to publish first. So he sort of stiffed Greeley with the scoop. And Greeley said, you know, I can't deal with Lincoln anymore. He's too smart for me. And I take it, Harold, that, that Lincoln's invitation to photographers and portraits into the White House was a way of him influencing the public as well. He really felt that he was sort of, you know, dying for his country's sins, a slow death. And he actually, I think he really, there's no evidence of this. This is my supposition. He visited the photographers often. He allowed them in the White House. They ruined those pictures because his son took the key to the dark room and hid it and wouldn't give it to the photographer. Um, but uh, he wanted people to see his own suffering. He wanted people to identify and sympathize. And by the end of the war, he had lost 20 pounds. He'd aged dozens of years in four. And uh, he, he, you could see that he was suffering as much as any family that had lost people in the war. Edna, we, if, if we, go ahead. If we, before we leave the, the, the press piece, OK, uh, we need to be reminded that there was an African-American yes. press as well. It was small because there weren't large numbers of African-Americans in the North, at least not in comparison to what was going on in the South. But there was an African-American press. You had the Anglo-African in New York. You had the Christian Recorder in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, so there, and you had Douglas's Monthly as well. And those papers are constantly writing editorials about what Lincoln is doing, and the criticism is scathing mm -hmm. until he issues the proclamation, mm -hmm. and then they all come on board. Whether or not he actually read any of what was being said in those papers, I don't know, but he certainly knew about Frederick Douglass. It is interesting to wonder if he ever read Douglass's monthly. We don't have a single clue, right. and boy, Douglass was rough on him. Absolutely. After the first inaugural, I mean, up until September, October of 62. Exactly. And Edna, another question submitted from the audience asked you to recommend some African-American uh, authors yes. uh, concerning the Civil War, Lincoln, and the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, one of my favorite authors uh, who, who did, uh, who studied uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the war and the African-American role in the war is a historian by the name of Benjamin Quarles who uh, taught, who spent almost his entire career at Morgan State uh, University in Baltimore, uh, in HBCU, an historically black college. I believe he, he did do, um, part of his career was elsewhere, but he, he spent the, the bulk of his years there. And he wrote wonderful books uh, in Civil War history, uh, books on Frederick Douglass, uh, he did a book called Lincoln and the Negro, and another was uh, The Negro and the Civil War. These are, are dated books, but they're still wonderful. There is not much that we have done since he wrote those books in the 50s and the 60s that would give us more information about what's going on from an African-American perspective. And historians who are writing about from that perspective today, if they're fair, they give him credit and they indicate that they're building on his pioneering research. So if you're going to start someplace, I would say start with the old stuff. Start with Benjamin Quarles' work, but you could also look at Du Bois, who's writing in the 1930s, W.E.B. Du Bois, 
who's publishing Black Reconstruction at a time when white historians are still talking about Reconstruction as the tragic era and the era of, of Black Republicanism and Black people who are taking over the state legislatures who are untrained in politics or anything else. You've got a black scholar who's telling a quite different story. You've got Rayford Logan, uh, who was at Howard for a number of years and chair of the history department at Howard for many years, who's talking about what happens in the aftermath of Reconstruction in a book called um, The Betrayal of the Negro. People like Charles Wesley uh, and others, Vincent Harding and all of those people are writing about the African-American experience. Frank, you know, it's interesting that John Hope Franklin wrote what a book called you? The Emancipation yeah. Proclamation right. in 1963. Yeah. Yeah, 50 and there was ago. not another book about the Emancipation Proclamation for 41 years. Absolutely. Which is, now there are about 10, 15 of them mm -hmm. recently. But John Hope Franklin's slim volume, which was commissioned as a centennial book, is still pretty good. And wrote Frank, books on yeah. slavery and reconstruction as well. So he covered the entire Yeah, period. well, he was the greatest. We've got less than 10 minutes left, but, but, but I did want you to comment on um, uh, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus by President Lincoln. I know you mentioned it earlier in passing. It's of interest to me because uh, I'm a lawyer. It probably couldn't happen in, in, in modern times. But why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And then we're going to go to a close. We're going to give you the, all three an opportunity the, to close. The thing about suspension of habeas corpus, which Lincoln authorized early in the war when Congress was not in session, when he couldn't get troops down through Maryland to protect the Capitol, he authorized Winfield Scott to suspend habeas on the rail lines running from Washington to Philadelphia. And for the benefit of the audience, habeas and corpus hey, means deliver when, the when body. I, when I was sitting as a trial judge, every day I would sign a writ of habeas corpus, which was an order to the warden of our prison to, to deliver to the court the next morning the following named prisoners to check on the validity of their detention. And when that's suspended, you don't get that kind of an order ordering the body. That's what happened during the Civil War. And that was enshrined in the Constitution. And the Constitution does permit the suspension of habeas corpus in cases of rebellion or invasion when the public safety requires it. And that's what Lincoln relied on. Now, it happens to be in the Congressional Article 1, Section 9, and those opponents of Lincoln's act say that, like Chief Justice Tawney, say that only Congress had that power. Lincoln's view was, if Congress is not in session, what am I supposed to do as someone who took the oath to see that all the laws were followed? That was his rationale for that. Congress would later authorize him to suspend habeas nationwide if he felt it necessary. And he did this because he thought um, that it was necessary to protect the nation from those who would, like a fifth column, would, would work to destroy it from within when they were not known to have committed any specific crime. Because we're so used to the civil and criminal processes of our courts today, rightfully so, that you, you've got to, there's got to be probable cause to make an arrest, to bring you to trial, to convict you beyond a reasonable doubt, and then you're sentenced. Well, when you're at civil war, it's sometimes difficult to wait for an act to happen before you should take a proactive stance to prevent that from happening. And that was Lincoln's viewpoint. And that's what he was describing in that letter to Erastus Corning that I mentioned earlier in Albany, New York, as to why it was necessary to arrest Clement Vallandingham, who was running for governor of Ohio, and one of Lincoln's most vitriolic critics. He was urging soldiers to desert. He was urging parents to prevent their sons from enlisting or complying with the draft. And for that, Vallandingham, who was a great orator, uh, was arrested um, and detained uh, and then banished to the Confederacy. Lincoln commuted his sentence. The Confederacy didn't want him either, so he wound up in Canada 
Uh, but that was the, that was the, the, the basis for, um, uh, for Lincoln's actions. Now, would that happen today? I don't think so, because there are a lot of First Amendment issues involved when Lincoln was suppressing dissent. And, and the body of law protecting the First Amendment was not even, uh, has not even blossomed yet in our culture. That wouldn't happen until after World War I. So, so um, that, was, that was fraught with, with great difficulties for him to, to pre preventively detain American citizens and to suppress dissent, which was really a violation of the First Amendment. In our remaining few minutes, uh, Harold, Edna, and Frank, in turn, I want you to think about and tell the audience what you want to leave them with about the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm first, eh? Yes. Okay. Well, I think as we dissect it and analyze, sometimes overanalyze Lincoln's psyche and the national mood and the international and domestic reactions to it, we do, we are threatened with losing our understanding of the immediate power and controversy that it had and triggered. It was a however delayed, however limited, however looked at as a future thing a hundred days into the future in the preliminary document. It was an absolutely um, hotly debated, long awaited, much feared um, revolution. It was the second, the beginning of the second American revolution and I I hope we can, whatever we think it failed to do or didn't do enough of or did too much of, we appreciate what, how radical it was in its day. And I think nobody appreciated this more than Lincoln for all the reasons we've discussed. He feared its consequences. He feared its impact on soldiers' um, morale and, and willingness to fight on the stock market, on the political uh, scene, on, on international relations. He was petrified of what would happen as much as he resolved that he had to do it. You know, on January 1st, 63, there were rumors abounding in the country that he was not going to fulfill it, that he was going to back away. There were lots of people writing, he doesn't have the gumption, he doesn't have the nerve, or he has so much sense, he's never going to go through with it. And when he finally got to doing it, many people believed it would happen in the morning. But there was a typographical error in the template piece on the bottom and Lincoln demanded that it be rewritten. So he didn't get to it until in the afternoon. People waiting in churches didn't know what was going on. And when Lincoln got it finally before him, proofread it one more time and saw that it was right, he picked up a pen to sign it. There are only three witnesses in the room. And then he put his pen down. And then he picked it up again. And then he put it down. And some people in the room said, well, he's not going to go through with it. He is you know, chickening out. And he looked up and he finally explained, clenching and unclenching his fist. He said, you know, I've been shaking hands at my New Year's reception for hours. And I can't, I have no feeling in my hand. It's almost paralyzed. And if I sign it now, people will look at my signature in 100 years and see that it's tremulous. And they'll say he hesitated. And if my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act. And my whole heart is in it. These are exact quotes. It's the one thing I remember. And he waited and massaged his hand and waited until the feeling came back. And then he signed Abraham Lincoln and looked at it very proudly and said, there, that will do. Edna. Um, I think people need to remember that black freedom was a collaborative effort. Lincoln issued the, uh, the proclamation. And in doing so, he invited black people to join the Union cause and to fight for their own freedom and for preservation of the Union. And they responded to that, whether they went to war in the Union blue or they stayed behind on the plantations. And I, I think that Lincoln recognized that this was a collaborative effort and that a debt was owed to African Americans. In uh, August of 1863, he wrote a letter, uh, uh, Frank, as mentioned, wrote a letter to James Conklin, a friend um, who was um, 
attempting to get him to rescind the proclamation. And so he's responding to that. He's being invited to come to um, Illinois to speak to a Republican group. Uh, and he uses this letter as an opportunity to explain why he will not rescind the proclamation. And he says he's already looking forward to a time when the war is actually over. And he's assuming that the union is going to win. And what he says in the letter is, um, you know, when the war is over, there will be some black men who can remember that with silent tongue and clenched teeth and steady eye and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind onto this great consummation. While, while I fear there will be some white ones unable to forget that with malignant heart and deceitful speech, they have strove to hinder it. And so it is clear he recognizes that they are rallying to the cause and they are helping to preserve the union, they're helping to secure the freedom of enslaved people, and they're helping to ensure their own freedom. Thank you, Frank. All, all of which makes me sincerely believe that there are very few people in world history that possess the political courage of Abraham Lincoln. He was clear and confident in his belief, beliefs as in emancipation when he did issue it. He learned to trust his own judgment. And while he made mistakes, they were really not mistakes of self-doubt. He um, knew his own mind despite criticism. And there was much criticism. He, he was called derisively Abraham Africanus I for issuing the proclamation. Now, that may not mean much to us today. In fact, I'd be honored if someone called me Abraham African as the first, but it was a term of, of derision. And I think um, he was obsessed with character, with selflessness and honor, all part of this political courage. And he was most alive in the midst of a fray. And boy, what a fray, the Emancipation Proclamation. So we all agree. <laughs> with everything he said. This evening we have all been witness to one of the most remarkable and incisive discussions ever conducted on the Emancipation Proclamation. And speaking for the entire audience, I would offer profound appreciation to our panelists for sharing your knowledge with us. We're deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At the end of the Civil War, some three million blacks remained in bondage. Slaves who received their freedom fought for it. Over 186,000 blacks, as you heard, enlisted in the Union armies. What you have not heard this evening is that 67,000 of them, fully one-third, died while wearing the uniform of the Union army. The average ex-slave in 1865 was essentially a child. Never in world history had civil and political rights been conferred at one stroke on so large a body of people nor had any people ever been less prepared to assume a new status. Lincoln had moved from a political conservative fighting to preserve the Union to a strong liberal fighting to build a new nation void of slavery. His Emancipation Proclamation was a foreword to a constitutional amendment that would at last implant freedom as a blessing on all Americans and would start all on the long and still uncompleted journey to full equality. Here in Virginia, they tell the story of how an aged slave minister reacted to Lincoln's proclamation. He did not have his grammar quite correct, but in the form of a prayer, he expressed these thoughts. Lord, we ain't what we ought to be. We ain't what we want to be. We ain't what we're going to be, but thank God we ain't what we was. And if this story is not true, it should be. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you all so much for being here. We invite you to join us for the reception and book signing across the street. And again, to four dear friends, thank you so much. A pleasant evening to you all.